So good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's Landscape Photography webinar. Hi, Nigel. I know I've got you in the wings. How are you doing? I am OK, Jay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. Well, back by popular demand. Can you, can you all hear me OK? I can hear can you now. Hear can hear you loud. Excellent. Nigel, absolutely perfect. Okay. So back again by popular demand. Uh, you know, your webinars always go down a storm. And uh, we talked the last time about you know, revisiting the, uh, the long exposure photography. So I know that's what we're looking at tonight. Um, Nigel, just before we get into anything, though, uh, for the people that are new with us tonight, just tell us a little bit about you, obviously how you got into the landscape photography and obviously the teacher that you are today as well. OK, um, yeah, based near uh, near near Brecon, a uh, place called Talibon. Anyone who knows it, always worth a visit. Um, I've been um, a bit of a fourth career, really, landscape photographer for me, doing it um, sort of as a living since about 2009. Started teaching about a year later. Uh, I teach groups, individuals. I've been working with the Photographer Academy for, oh, gosh, Jay, is it 2011 or 12, something like that? Oh, something Must like be around that, mustn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, mainly work in, in Wales, but uh, run my workshops everywhere, uh, anywhere that anyone wants to go. So I'm often up in places like Scotland, and up in Newcastle a couple of weeks time. So uh, gets me out and about, plenty of opportunity to take uh, more pictures for the portfolio as well. So um, hopefully I'll have the opportunity to share one, of the, one or two of those uh, with you today. Brilliant. Uh, obviously, you can see Nigel's links on the screen. We don't want, obviously, Nigel does want you to interact with him. I'll share these links to, with you via the chat panel as well, and you'll all receive a follow-up email from us tomorrow with all the links appropriately we've chatted about tonight. Nigel, I'm going to give you the screen, and obviously, as always, I'll let you know that we can see it uh, clearly. I always, I, I always have a heart-in-mouth moment at this <laughs> stage, because I never know if this is actually going to work or not, but <laughs> let's hope. <laughs> I'll let you know how we're at soon before, uh, before I hand you over fully. So I've just given you the screen. You should get the message there to share your screen. Yeah. Let's hope this works. I am seeing your screen in full screen mode, um, all perfect. Wow. So I'm going to go quiet. Okay. As, as I said before, we give you to Nigel. Any questions for Nigel, please pop those through the question panel. I'll ask them where appropriate or plenty of time at the end. Nigel, it's all yours, bud. Thanks, Jay. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks very much for um, for tuning in. Um, it's warmed up a bit, hasn't it? I was down in Cardiff today and uh, saw the remnants of the snow. We've not we didn't do too bad here, actually, but uh, compared to to some other places I've seen. Um, this is a, a revamp of uh, those of you who were with me. Uh, it's probably about 18 months ago. Uh, we'll recall I did um, a webinar on long exposure photography. I've um, revisited um, the, uh, the webinar. Um, uh, presentation. Some of it's uh, the same. A lot of it's new images, recent images I've taken. So um, those of you who have seen it before, uh, seen it before, hopefully you'll uh, you'll learn a fair amount of uh, of new things as well. Um, it's a mix, as the uh, title describes. It's a mix of te technique and creativity. There's a lot of technique involved in long, in long exposure photography, particularly things like the use of filters, control over settings, and that kind of thing. Um, so I'll um, do my best to explain all that uh, as I go through. I will do my normal thing of uh, inviting questions in natural breaks. Um, this presentation, as with most of mine, are divided into about four or five different sections. So at the end of each section, I'll, um, I'll uh, call Jay up and um, ask if there's any questions on the way. So that saves me having to, to talk <laughs> unbroken for, for the best part of an hour. And um, obviously, you know, the opportunity for you to ask questions, um, uh, which you might forget by the end. Um, so um, that's the first slide, as you can tell. Um, anyone who knows South Wales will undoubtedly know that spot. And I'm sure more than one of you has also photographed, photographed it yourself. It's, uh, it's obviously Penarth Pier. Uh, one, of my, one of my rather favorite long exposure shots. Um, I'll go into detail in that one a little bit later on. So what does this involve? Um, introduction, which is what I'm doing at the moment. Um, what subjects can we cover? Uh, I'll go into detail on that, range from landscape, architectural. Uh, on that, I should point out, we talk about landscape photography, but um, as with most of my, my presentations, the illustrations I'm going to show you are a little bit diverse, because what I try and encourage people to think about is not about um, landscape photography, people photography, architectural photography, whatever it happens to be, but, but composition, idea, technique, which you can apply across a whole range of different subject matter. So you'll probably notice within this, 
primarily landscape, there's an awful lot of architectural photography in this as well, um, partly because long exposure suits it extremely well. Um, creative technique, that's more about, about how you control the camera settings to, to get the ideas and get the, the processes you want. Um, a mistake that is often made is that uh, long exposure is used because people think it's a good idea to do it. And I've got a title here saying long exposure or not. It's not suitable for every subject matter. It's not suitable for every kind of idea. But hopefully I'll give you a few thoughts as to, as to when I think it's suitable and when it's not, because I've got to, some direct comparisons between being long exposure and your, your normal, normal short exposure. A um, few examples here. And finally, the technical side. Could be boring, hopefully not. A um, lot of explanation of things like the use of filters and a few tips on the kinds of filters you should buy if you haven't bought, bought them yet. Um, so, um, so as a starting point then, um, really the normal rules apply. Things like how it can contribute to your composition. Hopefully you'll get the, the idea that the, the, the examples I'm going to show you do contribute rather than detract from the composition and how you can use things like wind direction, for example, to contribute to the composition uh, of your image. Um, I'm going to go into equipment a little bit later on uh, in a little bit more detail, uh, but fundamentally really important, the three at the bottom, high quality tripod, your camera has to stay absolutely rock solid still. Um, wind and long exposure can be, a, can be a tricky one, and wind and rain and long exposure can be even trickier uh, for obvious, obvious reasons. A, a good filter system, and I say good uh, deliberately because uh, cheap filters are not advisable with this kind of, uh, this kind of technique. Um, I should point out when I talk about filters, uh, I'm largely talking about long exposure in daylight. Now, the example I've got here above, picture of Carnarvon Castle, uh, is a long exposure shot, but it's actually taken uh, virtual night, so getting pretty dark. So I was able to use something like a 15, 20 second exposure on this, which is pretty much all I needed to smooth out the water um, using, uh, using uh, the camera without a filter. Uh, but most of the examples, I'm showing you here will have used a filter system of some sort on it um, to uh, to effectively get the, the the long exposure length we're looking at in in daylight and a remote release and I'll, explain, I'll go on to, into a little bit more detail in that a little bit later on as well. So. Um, we have various subjects that can be used for long exposure. So a bit of a cross section here. Um, architecture, the one I've shown you before, standard long exposure shot. Uh, the one at Penarth Pier, wind coming towards the camera works very well with cloud movement, with the perspective lines of the um, of the of the boarding. Um, compositionally, by the way, really important that you have that absolutely spot on in terms of right down the middle because it's absolutely symmetrical. That shot has to be very symmetrical. So camera placement, uh, your point of view, in other words, is very important to that. Below that, star trail shot. A uh, number of you will probably have tried star trails. It's not one long picture. It's lots of pictures blended together to create a star trail effect. And uh, those of you who have probably seen it, which is probably the majority of you, will see that sometimes you can get the, the trails going you know, all the way around, which is roughly a two-hour exposure, a two-hour two set of images, shall I say. Um, so traffic lights, water, uh, um, and the one on the bottom right, a uh, bit of a sandstorm. And I probably mentioned to, uh, mentioned before that uh, I won't do that again because of the damage that caused to my equipment when I did it. Um, and people always think long exposure can often be um, like the shot of the, um, the uh, uh, Penarth Pier at the top, quite dynamic, quite strong, but actually it can smooth out things in a completely different way. The one on the bottom left, uh, long exposure smooths out everything. I've got a few more examples of that, so you can use it to create different moods in in uh, in an image. So, um, what is it? Very fundamentally, what is it? It's where effectively you're using movement to uh, add to the style and quality and character of uh, the features of the image. All of the images, uh, all of the features might be blurred, but you more usually some of them, sky, water, uh, people, 
um, uh, traffic, whatever it happens to be, you can use to create movement. I think most people recognize probably that mo majority of their long exposure images will effectively include, uh, will have water and, and, and more, more often sky. Um, it's creating that, uh, that, that, that movement effect in the clouds. Um, I find it works particularly well when you're contrasting static features against motion blur. Good example being the architectural shot at the bottom. It's the Sage Center in uh, in, New in Gateshead. I, wouldn't, I nearly said New Newcastle. It's on the other side of the river. Um, and um, and the way that uh, the cloud movement uh, uh, counteracts the the flowing lines of the steps. So these kind of things make a difference, and they 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 they're important when it um, comes to looking at uh, the composition of your images. Um, so what are the effects? Well, a couple of examples here. Uh, Pierhead in Cardiff. Those of you who live in South Wales will undoubtedly know this building. Um, and uh, a good example of the way that um, the sky movement contrasts well with the lines of the building. It really picks them out. Good example again uh, on the right hand side where the image at the top, it's uh, the Tyne again in Newcastle, um, is, is very cluttered. Uh, because of the detail in the cloud and in the water, the whole effect is a very cluttered one. Um, but what using a long exposure does in that case will smooth out uh, the sky, smooth out the water, and really pick out the lines of the uh, buildings and architectural features within the image. So it picks them out much more strongly. You'll also notice there is a change in the contrast of the image as well. That's not particularly down to post process, and that's because of the effect that long exposure will generally have on the image itself. It effectively tends to be very, very good at picking out fine detail. So it will, um, it's quite good for fine art, for fine art photography for that reason. Um, so it's a bit like a slow burn effect, really. And the other benefit is that um, if you've got moving subjects in the picture, the one of the pier head building had a fair number of people moving across the scene, that was a two and a half minute exposure, then they will disappear. Um, doesn't work in every case, and I'll show you a couple of examples uh, later on where it hasn't worked because the people have to keep on moving. They can't be hanging around. They just turn into this kind of rather horrible looking blur, particularly if they've got a red jacket on you, you're shooting in color. And also, if you've got too many people, you'll, what the effect will be, even if they're all moving, they're replaced by other people. So the effect will be a, a, a general degradation of the image. So it's, it, it's something that you, often, you will hear people say, oh, yeah, you can get rid of moving subjects. Yes, to an extent you can. Um, so a uh, couple of other effects here. You can see that uh, both pictures of the London Eye, one taken um, at, uh, after dark, one taken at sunrise. Uh, the long exposure has effectively turned the London Eye into a wheel where the spokes have gone, but it's turned the, uh, the rotation into, into a wheel. So these kind of things can be, uh, can be quite interesting, interesting to, wor uh, to work with. So um, a few general tips before we go into, uh, into details. Um, good quality tripod. Useful tip, uh, absolutely a good quality tripod. Weight is really important. You might get, you might be uh, like your new lightweight carbon fiber tripod, which probably costs quite a lot of money. Not necessarily very, very good in the wind and long exposures because there's nothing, there's no accounting, there's no substitute for weight. One good tip is to, you'll notice that legs on your uh, tripod, if you've got uh, a, 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 a decent brand, the legs will be able to spread out further than typically. I so often see people who will put the tripod up and simply have the legs out in the standard, standard um, uh, 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 mode. And what you have to do is to, is to um, play with the catches at the bottom and spread the legs out more. You get a much, much stronger base to it. Really important in wind to do that. It's not foolproof because the wind can still buffet the camera. And when it does that, you, you might as well, frankly, wait for another day. But at least it gives you a chance. Um, I mentioned about including fixed elements of the picture. That's not a given. And I've got a few examples I'm going to show you uh, during this presentation where um, you've actually got the, the, the smoothed out effect of the whole thing. It is, is in itself quite interesting. But more often than not, I will tend to include um, a fixed element of the picture, which is why it works so well with, with architectural photography. Uh, color balance. Uh, you'll find that your long exposure picture shooting in color will be blue. Um, you might want to correct these. 
but you might not. Um, if I go back to my very start one, my cover picture, uh, that's an uncorrected uh, um, result of using a 10 stop filter, uh, beg your pardon, a 15 stop filter, um, 10 minute exposure, and that's the blue one. Uh, I didn't like the color corrected one, I far preferred the blue one, but usually, because uh, it just adds a sort of uniformity, a monochromatic effect, without actually being in black and white, and I prefer the, the bluish monochrome, it suits the mood, the mood I think. Um, but more typically, you, you'll probably want to, uh, to color correct. Those of you who are not sure how to do that, really easy to do, click on a grey tone in uh, Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw, the uh, white balance tool, and it, 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 will, it will, provide you with a neutral tone to work with, it will automatically uh, correct. Um, so, I mentioned about filters, you will, unless you're shooting always in dusk or dark, you will need neutral density filters, even if you're shooting uh, when the light's going, you'll find yourself really strict to lowest ISO and uh, smallest aperture, and you'll be stretching the limits of your camera. So you really do need to need to buy um, a, I say, a, a, a neutral density filter uh, at least, or preferably two or three. Um, and I'll talk more about filters in the, uh, at the end. Rather annoyingly, mo a lot of DSLR cameras um, will only go up to 30 seconds unless you use bulb which means that you'll need a remote release that can lock the shutter down in bulb mode. More on them are becoming a little bit more flexible. For example, more modern, uh, a lot of the mirrorless cameras go up to a minute, and many have what they call a T mode, where you can press the shutter once to open the shutter and press it again to close it. But a lot of the cameras that I have, and many of you will have, will not do that unless you actually have a remote release that can lock the shutter down because it doesn't go beyond, go beyond 30 seconds. I have a 1979 Nikon F3 that went up to eight minutes. Why they can't do it in 2018, I really don't know. Um, so, subject matter. Oh, uh, right, I've reached the end of the first uh, first first phase. Haven't really gone into any detail, Jay, but um, anyone post any questions yet? Uh, we've had a couple. I know that some of them uh, you're going to address, so I'll hang on to those. But I thought uh, this actually okay. uh, we had the same question uh, twice, or well, similar questions from the same uh, two different people. So, um, do you find with the light exposures uh, that you get a, um, a lot of noise? Do you get more noise? And would you advise using sort of the noise reduction settings on the cameras now? Right. Okay. Really good for you. You mentioned about the noise reduction settings. You can get a lot of noise, but generally that's caused through underexposure in the shadow areas, and then having to pull the uh, pull the um, uh, the detail out. Um, you'll be typically using lower ISOs in any case um, with uh, long exposure photography, so you shouldn't need to uh, to. Uh, boost the ISO, which will be the biggest single cause, cause of getting uh, noise, underexposure of the shadows, and higher ISO are the two are the two biggest reasons. Shouldn't have a problem apart from that. Do not use non-exposure noise reduction in the camera. Always turn it off. When you buy a camera, it'll be on as as, as preset. Turn it off. Uh, any noise reduction always do afterwards. The main problem with long exposure noise reduction in camera is that it'll take as long to process the picture as you did to take it. So if you're standing there for four minutes taking the picture, the, the, the processing will then take a further four minutes. It's, uh, it's a recipe for disaster. So uh, yeah, keep it switched off, never use it. Brilliant. Um, and the other one I just want to ask you for now, where you were talking earlier about, uh, you know, with the long exposure and you were saying about subject matter, uh, you know, so yeah. people and blurs. Um, do you ever recommend uh, composites? So do, shooting the image and then blending uh, the long exposure with an image. Is, is that something that ever features or something you do? Yeah, it's, I haven't got examples um, of, uh, of that. Uh, where, it's cut, for example, it's often done with traffic lights, moving traffic lights, where the problem is that the, you want the, the effect of maybe the sunrise, but the, the light level's too long to get the cars moving, or the light's too bright for the, traffic light, uh, for the car headlights to show. So what you'll do is take one for the natural light, but you'll have taken one earlier or later when it's darker for the car headlights, so they're gonna be brighter. Not one I've done myself, but yes, that's something that can be done. It's fiddly in post-processing, but certainly can be done, yeah. Brilliant. Um, I haven't got any examples about here. No, that's fine. That's it for now. I'm going to hang on to the others because I'm pretty sure you're going to address them as you go, to be honest. Okay, then. 
Uh, okay, uh, I'll skim over this one because probably most of you will be pretty familiar with um, with uh, with waterfalls. Um, it's it's a good start to long exposure, getting the uh, the, the 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 movement effect in water. Um, only comment I'd make on this is that you don't to waterfall itself, you don't really need a very long shutter speed because the water's moving quite quickly. Um, half a second, a second will generally get mm, pretty much the desired effect. AFAS in the bottom example. Uh, the one that uh, taken at Glencoe to get the smoothed effect at the bottom, you'll probably need something like about 30 seconds. So um, it's it's because the water's just not moving in the same way. You've got a body of water which takes longer to smooth out. So think about, as with all cases, think about the effect you want from the pic from the picture. Um, so these are just a few comparative examples. One interesting effect of shooting waterfalls you can get. Uh, the one taken at School Gladys and the Brecon Beacons at the top, you'll find that because of the way that water falls when it when it hits hits the water, the waterfall falls. It hits the, the main body of water. It creates a swirling motion, uh, um, a uh, an anti-clockwise swirling motion, or is it clockwise? Looks like anti from that. Um, and uh, it will create a swirly pattern. So that's that's something you can have a go at. You can often see it happening when you've got sort of um, frothy stuff. The frothy stuff is usually caused by uh, deposits of peat coming down from the mountains as a content of the water. Um, one on the right, standard waterfall shot, short and long exposure. It is generally, I um, I don't really like the short exposure effect on waterfalls. Um, it looks a bit, to me, it looks a bit messy. One thing always, of course, to be mindful of is if you've got overhanging tree branches with waterfalls, if you go, depending on the wind, of course, and often the water can create wind in itself, then you'll get the movement in the branches. So they will become a little bit of a blur. I've got a little bit on common mistakes later on. Um, so a couple of examples of waves here. And just to reinforce that that I, uh, I will often see um, people will always shoot long exposures when they go down to the sea. They smooth out everything. It doesn't apply in every case. I've got a slide in a minute which shows a comparison between different exposure lengths. But the shot of the wave is a good example where a short exposure was what I needed because I wanted to capture the detail in the wave. It would have collapsed with a long exposure. Um, it's taken in Marlowe's in Pembrokeshire, by the way, uh, in the, the, the south coast of Pembrokeshire. Lovely spot. Um, so hid the sun behind the rock, backlit the wave, um, pulled out some of the detail in the wave in post-processing to add, just to add the translucent effect. But having a short exposure which froze the wave, mo wave motion was really important in that shot. The two at the top, of course, completely different, uh, different taken at, uh, at uh, Elgol on the Isle of Skye, probably the, one of the world's most popular photographic spots. Um, then uh, you'll see the, the effect of, uh, of of, of using a, a longer exposure. So the overall thing there, and I, it, this is a message I've reinforced in a number of webinars before, your starting point, question you ask at the, start, uh, at the start, what am I trying to get out of this picture? What do I want to achieve? Um, so I, I talk about a lot in composition as your starting point. It applies to every single thing in photography in terms of the settings of the camera you used, how you compose the picture, what am I trying to achieve? What's, what, what, I, what do I want to convey to the viewer of the image? And that's at the heart of whether you use long exposure or not as well. Um, I mentioned to a minute ago, I've got a few other examples later on, um, that long exposures work very well with architecture, cityscape structures, because of that contrast between, uh, between um, the hard surface and the smoothed out effect of, of sky detail. I've got some comparisons in, in a minute as well. Um, so with these, I've generally tried to uh, use examples where the line, the wind direction has complemented uh, the uh, lines of the building and the composition of the shot. So if you look at the one at Tintin Abbey, it's the composition central. You're looking, it's very simple composition, main subject right in the middle of the picture, and therefore, in usually in that kind of situation, you want the cloud uh, uh, detail going either directly towards or directly away from the camera. Um, if you try, it doesn't work so well in the pier head shot. You can see the cloud detail is, while still picking out the pier head quite well, it's not working in quite the way I envisaged. Uh, works much effect, more effectively at the one at Tintin Abbey. And also, if you look at the one on the right-hand side, which is an office block opposite Cardiff, Cardiff Prison. 
no it's not i do beg your pardon it was cardam vale college i beg your pardon um it's a different building i'm thinking of um you'll see that the lines of the cloud movement uh is precisely complement the direction of the structure so that's kind of what you're looking for obviously it's a bit hit and miss because you have what you are generally unless you go back time and time again you get what you uh what what you're faced with uh on on most shoot uh, shoots when you go once or twice but ideally this is the kind of thing that you're looking for you're looking for the cloud movement and the detail in the sky to complement the uh the structure of the landscape or the building and for that uh, using that example again uh, i showed you that one before taken at the sage center the way that the um the uh, uh, cloud movement effectively rotates or works in the opposite direction to, from uh, from the steps. That one's actually about 12 minutes, by the way. That exposure that was t that was a 17 stops worth of exposure in total, and a neutral a three stop neutral graduated because they were shooting against the sun. There's actually the sun in that shot hidden behind the clouds, so it took an awful lot of effect uh, to uh, to a uh, treatment to um, to expose that correctly so it works well with architecture and cityscapes and again works well with features and monuments as well all these if it, I've used some some element of consistency here using uh, cloud direction coming towards or away uh, from the camera with these examples um, rural and mountain landscapes not something I do as much um, I find on the whole that um, that the softness and the form and shape of the landscape tends on the whole not to work as well as it does with uh, with architectural shots or or structures or features or monuments it's a real generalization that um, and there's always examples where you can find uh, find shots that that work quite well the one on the Elan Valley in the top right um, I think works quite well the color in the sunset You'll notice that a lot of my examples are taken in black and white. I happen to think that long exposure, for me, works more effectively in black and white, reduces an image to simple tones, whereas color can often distort. Um, so, uh, but, so that's a bit of a rarity, the rarity of the color image. I say that it works well uh, uh, there as a landscape picture, but of course it's got an architectural feature with it. It's with it. Even the shot taken at the old man of the store, bottom right, it's 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 monumental in its in its effect because of the rock so um i i think i've not seen many examples where i'm happy with long exposures shots that have worked well in straightforward uh um rural or um, or kind of field pastoral mountain type landscapes it's not something i do very more a lot uh, very much i think i prefer the cloud detail with that but again a bit of a generalization uh oh Right, got through that one quite quickly. Jay, any more questions? We do, sorry, I was just finding my mute. Oh, I thought, you, I thought you'd got No, 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 <laughs> just like, my hand was away from my mouse, I had to mute myself. Um, okay. uh, this came in when we were looking at the waterfalls. Um, somebody mentioned that a while ago, that uh, they can't remember who the photographer was, but uh, they'd read an article about when photographing long exposures of waterfalls, uh, the particular photographer, uh, also added flash to the exposure. Any thoughts on that? Is that something you wow. know? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Did it work? I don't know. I don't know. That'd be a good. <laughs> so, it um, sounds you know, horrible. It sounds it sounds really horrible to me. But uh, maybe 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 it was fantastic. Maybe it done some wonderful thing with the uh, the reflections. I don't know. But I uh, I I've got a, a waterfall shot uh, taken which I took last November, which I, which I used torchlight to shine some light on the on the waterfall itself. Because it's a nighttime shot, otherwise the water would have been lost, uh, and there was no moon to light it up either. So I've got a shot showing that, but it certainly wasn't flash. It was a very subtle head torch. Okay, well, I'll be interested. Um, Maybe which, we I paint, which I painted with light. I've got Please an example of that in a minute. Do some research to see if we can find out. Because Terry, who posed the question, said that uh, he said that the images did look amazing. So I thought, just not post. That. Did it? Yeah. Yeah. Look, I mean, yeah, I've I've learned something. I I I not something I've tried, and I I'm struggling to see how it would work. Uh, what he Maybe it just catch. Maybe it just captures a, I, I don't know. Are we saying multi-flash as well now? So I'm just trying to picture it in my head, but uh, mm. see if we can, find, it. See if we can find that one. I'm yeah, gonna, yeah. See if we can good, find it there on the Academy Facebook or something like that, that'd be good. Um, okay. Uh, okay, the other one I've got for you, nice. Similar question to the one we had earlier about 
uh, when we were on about composites, you know, with because when we were looking at the skies and obviously the architectural and stuff, you know, you as you well know in this in this uh, in this game that you could be at your location, uh, you know, for quite a while to get the shot that you want, and you might not get the clouds yeah. and stuff. So, are you ever tempted, or do you ever put the sky in afterwards again? So going back on the route of composites, really, never ever have. Never once in any shot. That's just a personal preference, I think. Clearly, in a shot where you've got, for example, that one on the top uh, right, that shot, that would be very easy because the building lines are very clean. You could simply add a layer with the sky, chuck the, chuck the building on top, and in fact, you do that as a, uh, as two, as two, uh, as a composite with two shots. Uh, yeah, very easy to do. Personally, I do it in camera, but that shot, in particular, um, would be easy to do. And of course, if you're picking out, if you if you use something like the um, uh, oh, what's that tool called? The magic wand tool. You just pick out the line of the building and uh, pop it on on, to, on the front of the sky. Yes, easy to do. Um, less easy to do with more complex horizons, but uh, some of them quite easy. Uh, not something I do. I tend to do it all in camera. Um, is that is that a good thing? I don't yeah. know. That's no, just, I mean that's personal that's preference. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, sticking with the clouds uh, uh, um, and the skies, the question that's just come in now, because uh, and loving the images, but, but by the way, so before I cut the question in half, um, is there a particular when going out to take these shots? Is there something to particularly look for in the cloud formations and maybe the wind speed? You know, are there sort of some tent telltale signs? It's going to be oh, good for long exposure. That makes sense. I think it makes sense. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, hopefully, you'll, uh, there's a few examples in this next section which will, will illustrate this. Now, typically, you tend to look for contrast. Now, that can be contrast of uh, of of you're, you're more usually shooting against the light because light. With, even when you've got a dark overclass sky, when you shoot, when the sun is in that part of the sky, you've got more contrast than if the sun is in the other part of the sky. So, uh, and that will be where you've got overall clouds. So you've got dark cloud and light cloud. However, you can also get strong light and dark effects in the sky when you've got white against blue sky converted to black and white. Doesn't work so well in color, uh, but converted to black and white, you've got quite a lot of contrast because you basically knock the blue down to a black, effectively, and, uh, and and keep the clouds white. So that creates contrast. So that kind of sky with blue sky and white clouds, or or grey clouds, or um, a, a an overall uh, um, cloudy sky, but more with contrast in, between the greys and the whites. Can, uh, can can have that effect. I've got both examples here. However, you can also use a uniformly white sky with long exposures, and I've got a couple of examples of that in the moment as well. So there are there are, the, 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 cl the skies will produce different effects, but there's no great wrong or right about it. Apart from I would say plain blue sky. You haven't got a lot to work, haven't got a lot to work with really. Mm. Uh, most of the questions that I have, so I know we're going to come in. There are actually a lot of the questions are about filters, so I know we're going to talk about that afterwards. So I'll hang on to those. Okay. So all back to you. 20 to 8. I'm going to start speeding up, I think. Um, right. Uh, OK, so um, a few things. Creative technique, both in camera, but also in terms of how you control uh, uh, and assess the, the, the external elements. So a bit of a mixed bag with this section. Um, any of you who've been to London recently will know that Big Ben doesn't look like that at the moment. So if you're tempted to go and have, give that one a try at the moment, maybe wait a couple of years. Uh, it's not looking great. Uh, Has the Parliament is also covered in scout in covered in uh, in tarpaulin as well. Um, I've got a bit of a story behind that picture. I'll show you it in a minute. Um, so um, cloud movement, firstly. Cloud movement shooting, uh, uh, towards shooting position. I've explained this one before. It's my the one I use probably more than any other. Works definitely most effectively when you've got a very clear main subject in the middle of the frame. So it's an, it's a strong compositional element. Tends not to work as well. I've got an example on the bottom right. Does it work? Not so sure. Uh, one taken on the Y Valley. 
Um, I'm not sure the sky, the moving sky, adds more than the particularly more than um, than a, a normal short exposure sky would. In truth, uh, with the others, you can quite quite clearly see it's a very strong part of the composition. And using the cloud moving to, towards or away from you means effectively you're leading. You, it leads to a composition which is very much about main subject right in the middle of the frame, and the eye is drawn straight to it. With these ones, um, different emphasis where um, the you'll notice with these, the main subject is not a single subject main subject in the middle of the frame. It's a main subject which is placed elsewhere or running across the frame. So in this case, uh, the cloud movement going across the image suits the subject matter better than the cloud movement going towards or away from the camera. Try and think about the cloud movement direction complementing uh, the the composition or change your composition to suit. Now the one on the bottom right uh, taken at Barmouth um, completely flat grade A. So uh, what that did was to just pick out the structure of the bridge. Ideally could have done without, uh, could have done with um, a bit less visibility because if you can see there's a little island some, I'm sure somebody here will know the name of that little island, um, just behind the railway bridge. And really what I wanted the railway bridge to be standing out on its own. Could I have photoshopped that island out? I don't know. Generally, I prefer not because, you know, I tend to work with what I see, really. Um, but um, uh, um, so the very flat sky, uh, two and a half minute exposure, smoothed out everything and added a very uniform grey tone, which, which complemented the simple structure of the bridge. Uh, the one of the the, seven, the old uh, the old original uh, seven bridge um, cloud direction um, coming toward across the across the picture, which complemented the water quite well. And the same with the one taken at uh, at Port Talbot still works as well. So all of the others you can see I've worked, I've used the cloud direction where it, it's complemented the um, the the uh, uh, direction of the other features, or just picked out a structure within the image. I mean, obviously, one the top at uh, Port Silver Steelworks, by the way, the direction of the smoke will complement the cloud direction because the wind's coming from the same direction, so it's going to affect both. So bear that in mind. Um, experimenting with shutter speed, just a few examples of no wrong or right about this. Uh, four different shots taken on the same afternoon on Elgol. Um, just to see the different effects of using different uh, shutter speeds. 102 minutes, don't like it at all. Smoothed out everything, just to me, it looks a bit fuzzy and a bit nothingy. 15 seconds are quite light, it's quite dramatic. It's retained some structure in the sky and retained some structure in the water, which I think, I, I, I think works quite well. But also the shorter ones, I think, work well as well. One at a fifth, which just adds a little bit of movement but retains quite a lot of structure in the water. Clouds don't move. Uh, during that time. And the one on the bottom right, which is one second, which smooths out the water more, again, not enough to get the cloud movement, but really adds a kind of sweeping smooth effect to the water. So on the whole, with these shots, I prefer, and this is very much an individual judgment, I prefer the shorter exposures. But the, the rule here is experiment, because you don't quite know what you're going to come out with, and do resist the temptation, as you can see on the top right, which frankly doesn't work particularly well. Um, uh, try and resi resist always using a really long exposure because it's not suitable in, in a, many situations. Um, a couple of shots here, you'll notice a couple of them are taken by, by other people, so I've uh, um, credited them as, um, as, as, uh, as I need to. Um, so um, uh, uh, playing with light movement, a couple of ideas. I'm going to say a little more about this. Uh, first one, 45 seconds exposure with car headlights. And it, but you notice with both of these, the long exposure, the car headlights are a strong part of the composition. They aren't just moving headlights for moving headlights sake. The one on the right, I've used this on my composition paper as well. It's quite a good example where a single car headlight can be so much more effective than having a whole load of them. The temptation is to think, oh, I need lots of cars here <laughs> to get an effect, but to get them lights go lots of lights going backwards and forwards but I so much prefer the uh, the single light um, so uh, sometimes less is more um, so a couple of examples as I mentioned with uh, moving lights at the bottom do be careful um, it's too easy to get close to traffic and these are big these are both buses so they're big so um, they can cause quite a lot of damage 
So you've got to be careful with that too, which is why they were taken by somebody else and not by me. Um, panoramic photo merges. Um, little to say about this possibly, but um, just to show that uh, people people often think that panoramic photo mergers are difficult with long exposures because of movement, because of difficulties with, uh, with the, street, the scene changing, but actually it can be done. Even with a moving sky, you'll find that the sky tends to blend. The softwares are actually very, very clever. This is about an 180 degree angle of view taken in New Zealand. Uh, those are the images below, eight of them, I think. Yep. Um, so um, shows, you know, a really broad, broad sort of stretch across the waterfall. Quite a dramatic effect. Dramatic effect. So well worth trying. I think probably uh, doing it with moving skies probably a little bit optimistic because so much can change during that time. Particularly if you're shooting at dusk, inevitably. If you're shooting at dusk, the light's going to drop as well. So you've got that to manage as well. But certainly worth a try, particularly when, when you're using uh, uh, when uh, you're working with light, which doesn't change very much. Very difficult to do this with uh, days where you've got changing light, uh, showery, uh, sunshine and cloud, that kind of thing, because you don't want the cloud, the sunshine constantly coming in and out. That can be fatal for long exposures. So uh, just something to be mindful of. Um, Another photo merge shot, three, it is three shots in one. Um, graduated filter, absolutely essential for this kind of shot. It was a real struggle getting the detail, keep it, holding the detail in the sky. Um, and uh, so, yeah, you need both um, this six stop ND, what was this, 13 seconds F8, okay. Um, and uh, a three stop uh, graduated filter. So you really need all the, uh, all the, the tools at your, your disposable, uh, disposal, really. Um, yeah, the, the one thing I point out with this one as well, um, I kept it at 13 seconds, could have gone up to 20 at the outside, but go beyond that and you start to get the sky to move. I didn't want the sky to move in this shot. I wanted um, the movement, the smoothed out water, smoothed out in the foreground, but the sky I wanted to be, uh, to, to have retain most all on most or all of the detail in it if you look at closely the little bit of movement in it maybe i should have held it to uh to something like five seconds something like that um but uh but i went a bit longer it seems to work okay um does go back to possibly to uh what was said earlier um about uh, blending two yeah could easily do it take one for the foreground one for the sky and put them together um so um yeah maybe it's something i should do more of really um, this one, uh, star trails, this is 40 shots put together, quite a short star trail, this is 20 minutes. Um, I include this, it's more night photography than long exposure photography, but it is long exposure by its very nature. Um, so 20 minutes worth, as you can see, doesn't make the trails actually particularly long. I, uh, two reasons I didn't do it any longer. The moon came up, therefore it would have, uh, that was the moon in the shot, it's not the sun because otherwise you wouldn't know the stars. Um, and uh, so the moon would have shined directly into the camera. And also I was so freezing, I wasn't going to stay that a moment longer. Those of you who live in South Wales will know that as Ben Havana, of course, and Corndy. Um, this one, I've explained this one before. This one I've called making comparisons. And it's just a few examples of the way you can work with uh, color or black and white or you can work with long or short exposure and a few common errors, which we all tend to make at times. Um, so um, um, with this, no real wrong or right about it, but just a, a, a sometimes down to personal preference, really. So this one I've mentioned before, I'm not going to go into any detail. That's the, un, um, the one at the top left is the, uh, the, the corrected one. It's a corrective for a gray tone. Just don't like it, really. Um, I like the blue one. But again, that's probably a personal preferences. Uh, uh, preference of mine. Uh, this one, uh, color, black and white, color. The really does the decision to be made with color and black and white. Does the color complement the image? Is the color an intrinsic part of why you took the picture? Uh, in my mind, with the color one, there's no there's no outstanding feature there which says color is it contributes to that. You've got a bit of green, you've got a bit of blue, you've got some brownie effect in the stone, you've got some gray in the sky. The statue is a kind of bluish color, isn't it? Bluish, 
mauve turquoisey color uh, but it's a real mixture so when you've got that kind of choice then black and white works really well it's about simple tones and the simple tones pick out the sky and it's contra the way it picks out the uh, the uh, the, um, the statue um, anyone who doesn't know this spot uh, if you drive up north of Glasgow up to Glencoe it's on the roadside just past a place called Speenbridge this one um, very clear, uh, this is taken on a housing development in Cardiff, um, very clear uh, distinction uh, between uh, a short exposure picture and a long exposure picture, um, taken in both colour and uh, black and white. A um, question was asked earlier about the kind of cloud that um, you, uh, you use or kind of day you use for long exposure. Now, um, one thing, of course, an overcast day will like that the tones will all be flat therefore all your black and white tones particularly if you convert it to black and white all your black and white tones are going to be color converted to shades of gray in black and white when you shoot with the sun out your black and white light and dark is created by light changes as well so think about that as part of your black and white conversion do you want uniform tones on the building in which case you need a gray day or flat light and therefore you need to make your sky tones uh, be created by light and dark in the cloud if you're happy because a day like that with uh, some blue some white cloud but mainly blue sky the light the sun's going to largely usually going to be going in and out quite a lot so typically the sun's going to be out during your exposure during a long exposure it won't be during a short one because you can time it right uh, because you can time it when the sun is either out or when the sun is going to be in. When, a long ex when you're doing a long exposure, the sun's going to be going in and out. So therefore, you're going to get this light and dark effect on the building. Do you want that? Maybe you do, or maybe you don't. But that will dictate the kind of day and the kind of cloud structure or cloud type that you're going to be using for your image. Uh, my preference on this one, I think the long exposure versions work much, much better than the short one. And I think on the whole, the black and white one. Happy to listen to any disagreement. Um, this one, um, yeah, uh, far prefer the color one. Uh, to me, funnily enough, the black and white one just doesn't have the punch and the um, the the the, uh, the 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 impact that the uh, the color one does. Uh, maybe because I've seen the color and the color has got so much strength in it, uh, and therefore the black and white looks looks okay. It looks 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 pales into it as a comparison but I think maybe the fact that the the tones are quite uniform but I, I far prefer the color one as I mentioned a lot of this is down to individual preference rather than uh, what's right or wrong a um, number of you will have seen this image before I've used it a number of times but it's a it's a good example of um, of the way that uh, that uh, you can get uh, the wind direction coming towards or away from the camera um, uh, leading to what could be a very minor feature in the picture, the pier at the, the pillar at the end of the at the end of the time bridge, but it draws the eye right to it, um, ends up with a very very strong composition because of the darkness of the sky. Um, so um, uh, yeah, it's quite a good quite a good example. I think again, I prefer the color one. I think the color adds quite a lot to the image. Um, another example I've got. Oh, hang on. I'll, I'll go back to the others. I thought I'd introduce this one at the same time because it's a quite a good example of short exposure against long exposure. Uh, the the, the uh, short exposure one, as you can tell, the water hasn't been smoothed out to the same degree, and obviously there isn't the cloud movement. Um, the colour's stronger in the short exposure one for the simple reason that I took them consecutively, consecutively, but at that time of the morning, the colors, the light changes, and the color changes incredibly quickly. So very quickly, that red color in the cloud disappeared during the time it took me to expose the second one. You'll also see that the clouds filled in quite a lot. Uh, Ten minutes later, there wasn't a bit of blue sky left. Um, so things can change very, very quickly. But also, what it does, it will turn effectively a um, a uh, a, uh, the composition into um, something which is which is much more symmetrical and much more of a, uh, a composition which is focused on the center of the frame the top one the pier in the middle 
the, the, the water and the clouds don't draw the eye towards it. The bottom one they do. So it fundamentally changes the composition of the image, uh, image as well. Just going back to the other two. Um, uh, these really are down to individual preferences. And even now, I'm not quite sure which one of these I prefer. Obviously, St. Paul's. Anyone who knows St. Paul's? Most of you do. Um, so, uh, oh, I haven't put the exposure time. I think it was about a minute, minute and a half, I think. Um, again, cloud direction towards the building or away for the building. So that, uh, that works quite well. The um, uh, cloud has got more texture in the short exposure one. And that's why I'm slightly in two minds of it, uh, about this one. I think the short exposure one to me has got more of a gritty look and more of a kind of uh, a, 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 a dull, rainy day, somber look, which actually I think I prefer. Um, so comes back to my uh, original question uh, of, doesn't always apply using a short or a long exposure. I think on the whole with this one, I prefer the, the short exposure version. As you can tell, it's made very little difference to the, um, to the look of the reflection in the pavement as well. Um, wet days uh, and urban, wet days, cloudy days and urban landscapes go very, very well because you can make an awful lot out of reflections as well. And this one was also very good at the long exposure. There were a few people around uh, the short exposure obviously matched a capture moment where they weren't there. The long exposure, they're walking across, but obviously they disappeared. This one, uh, it's a very similar effect, but a mountain landscape rather than an urban landscape. Um, very subtle difference between um, the short exposure and one which is uh, ooh, four or five minutes. Um, just a, a smooth smoothed out wispy effect in the clouds compared to the um compared to the uh to to the, the the static clouds above the mountains it's you've just got that smooth silky effect of the clouds just uh, the wispy clouds and of course they're forming on the mountains and evaporating again as well so it's quite a subtle difference with that one uh common errors uh how are we doing for time Ooh, getting short right contrasty light got to be careful with it um Two really bad examples here. One, a uh, um, Panath Pier again. Another one um, with um, taken in Tropshire. Uh, they don't work. Um, it just looks the contrasty light makes the whole composition and the whole effect look 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 messy. So don't always think you need to go for uh, for for bright days. Overcast days can be much easier to handle that uh, the, the the difference in in uh, the, the tonal differences in uh, in the features because the tones. Well, the cut the translation of light and dark in the in the um, in the features and the colours will translate into black and white tones. So don't think you need a contrast today. Two at the bottom, poor poor light, poor sky detail. Um, there, I tried different exposures. It's just that the sky detail didn't really work in either of them. So um, yeah, you just don't really get a very strong effect. Uh, can be particularly noticeable when the clouds are moving across the camera. Um, one on the left hand side. Uh, you'll see that the effect of the picture is degraded by a whole load of people uh, at the, the, uh, in the background. So it's turned into this kind of very dark, um, fuzzy effect in the background. Um, tried different shorter exposures as well, but it just it never really worked. Um, sh sh using shorter shutter speeds, um, the, you've, got, you've got movement in the tree branches and the one on the waterfall at the top, and the one at the bottom, the sky's just not moved enough. So Try and think about it just, you just a little bit of movement, enough to blur the uh, the um, uh, the the barley, but not the cloud. So think about the um, how suitable the shutter speed is you're using. Uh, right, I image example. We've got to eight o'clock. I think it's important I get to the technical stuff, Jay. So I'm going to go. I'm just going to talk through for about another five minutes. Yeah. Fine, pal. You go. For yeah, OK. Um, so, uh, right, I've gone through this one. Don't need to explain it again. So that saves a bit of time, doesn't it? Um, yeah, this one I thought it's worthwhile coming back to. Um, that's the original raw file. Um, shows you how much you can pull out of a, uh, a, uh, a raw file these days, both with in-camera uh, quality, raw quality, and also the uh, processing software, the imaging software. Um, so. Uh, in truth, if I kept that in color, by the way, uh, the, the, under, the shadow underneath the bridge would reveal quite a lot of image noise, not so noticeable in black and white. Uh, probably wouldn't, 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 wouldn't want to blow that up the size of a wall, though, because it would uh, demonstrate a little bit of noise at the bottom. But the point is made. That is the original raw file. I was actually going to retake it, but uh, a man on the, um, on the, 
a big man on the uh, steps leading up to Westminster Bridge, told me in no uncertain terms that I wasn't allowed to take pictures from there. So he moved me on, but I was going to have another go. Uh, but fortunately, I managed to, re managed to rescue this one. Um, that one, shown you it before. Uh, anything else to mention? Not particularly. Hard grad, yeah, uh, it probably doesn't need really reinforcing too much, but uh, uh, a graduated filter um, used when you're shooting against the light, uh, when particularly when the light isn't balanced with uh, but balanced, is really important. You will nearly always blow the sky. Um, hard grad's okay for that because there's a relatively straightforward horizon between uh, between the uh, hori uh, the, the, the the horizon line is quite is quite level. Um, so um, a soft grad tends to work, particularly with buildings. Hard grad can be really hard, uh, sort of in more ways than one. So try to use a soft grad for that. But uh, you'll find yourself with buildings, particularly when they're protruding into the sky, having to do quite a lot of post processing as well. Um, this one, um, mentioned this one before as well about the people moving across the picture, a uh, minute and a half, oh, I thought it was more than that, um, 13 stops worth of filters, um, yeah, so it picks out the uh, building line very well and picks out the, uh, the detail on the paving quite well as well. This is the one where I light painted it, uh, Jay, you mentioned uh, earlier on about the, the chap who used flash, this was not using flash, this was painted, uh, the waterfall painted with light, um, I used it very subtly, uh, in fact I had to pull, I used it only for, this was a 15 second exposure, I used uh, my torch for about five seconds of it, uh, and even then had to pull the light down quite a lot because it still uh, illuminated the foreground too much. Uh, but just uh, uh, something you can uh, you can try. Um, so uh, yeah, could have done with this with snow on it because it obviously would have balanced the the exposure quite a lot and brought more, much more detail out in the mountain. Getting that detail actually uh, that wouldn't uh, stand uh, close scrutiny in terms of image noise particularly well. Uh, even I did uh, try a longer exposure one as well, but it didn't reveal much more either. Um, now I've explained that one enough. Uh, don't need to explain that one anymore, I don't think. Good, I'm going through these quite well. This is one of John's, a uh, colleague of mine. Um, I haven't got an equivalent one, so I thought I'd use his with his permission. Um, so uh, this is a really good example of a high key image. Uh, where you've got a single feature, but against a very white, people think, you know, not much detail in the sky won't work, hardly any sky detail, uh, um, using a really high key post-processing effect on the water, uh, turns the uh, pulls the bridge, uh, bridge out uh, really well, much more so than it would would have done on a, um, on a where, where you've got a lot of, a lot of dark tones. Uh, be, be mindful of um, the way that uh, the light changes the color of water as well. Never really think, really think about it, but actually you can often get um, uh, very quick changes between light tones in water and dark tones in water, simply down to the cloud above the water. Um, it's often something that's, that's, that's forgotten when shooting water. Um, this one's more of a night shot, really, um, but um, it's, a, uh, it's, it's kind of a long exposure, I suppose. It was 20 seconds, so I thought I might as well include it, and it's a recent shot, so yeah. Um, so uh, yeah. Um, for itself really. Uh, when shooting stars, I don't go beyond 20 seconds because if you go beyond 20, some people seem to be able to go beyond 30. I look at my 30 second exposure pictures and I see the clouds turned in, this big above the sky, the stars turned into little lines as opposed to points of light. Now that's proved to me by the fact that when you're shooting star trails, you use a whole series of 30 second exposures. Well, it wouldn't produce a star trail if they weren't little lines in the first place. So um, uh, yeah, I tend to stick to, the, uh, to 20 seconds. Um, filters, technical tips, good two minutes on this. Uh, you can view this afterwards anyway, so hopefully you'll be able to go through this in your, go this in your own, uh, through this in your own time. Um, heavy tripod, spreading the legs out, as I've mentioned. Do not use the extending column. Absolutely don't do it. Uh, if there's any wind at all, uh, I, I will often see people who will not extend all the legs of the tripod, but they'll extend the column anyway. It's the last thing to use. So try not to use it, particularly with, long, uh, with the long exposure. Um, Turn off uh, vibration reduction because that will introduce movement. And I know you hear a lot about that, but it does it does happen. Uh, it can wreck long exposure, particularly particularly those when you've got three or four seconds where actually the initial movement is really important. So turn that off. Um, try not to use F22 
try and extend the spo exposure using filters rather than going uh, go going down to the smallest aperture particularly um, you 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 can you can lose some uh, some image quality going to f22 obviously varies between uh, between lenses tends to what what you uh, develop what's called chromatic aberration which will find effectively a color fringing effect on the to, particularly towards the edges of, of the frame where it'll start to break down the rgb red green uh, red green and blue into its components uh, particularly at the edges and could particularly happen with a cheaper lens so try not to use f22 mentioned before uh, before about not using long exposure noise reduction um, use low iso as has been before reducing image noise high quality filters uh, and I mentioned about oh yeah Nikon if you've got a Nikon and I've fallen foul of this more than one occasion do use the rear shutter curtain on the back of the camera why they've not resolved the issue with light ingress coming through the viewfinder rather than adding a viewfinder curtain to stop light getting it light getting in I do not know no other make has this problem However, Nikon do. So if you've got a Nikon, make sure you close it. Otherwise, you'll find a pink streak across the entire frame if you go anything beyond 30 seconds, and it'll wreck your picture. And I've done it on more than one occasion because it's really easy to forget. I mentioned about bulb setting before. Uh, different filters. Um, I use a square filter system because they're flexible. You can combine filters and frequently, as in many of the cases, I've sh the examples I've shown you before here, um, you have to combine a neutral density filter with a neutral graduated filter of various strengths um, i've also on occasions used a polarizing filter with as well so often use three filters at the same time so um, um, so a square filter system will allow you much more flexibility all you do is effectively buy separate filter rings for your different fil uh, lens lens filter thread sizes and buy universal holders and slot the filters uh, into them. Do not buy cheap filters. I won't mention brands; it wouldn't be fair. Uh, but um, but but look at look at look at the. You get you tend to get what you pay for. Um, so um, um, yeah, don't buy the cheap ones. I've got certain ones in mind. Um, right. So a bit of an explanation about neutral density filters. Really, you get them from two stop to. Uh, Ooh, 16 stop I think I think Lee do one up to 20 now or something like that which is kind of a bit over the top really um, don't bother with two stop uh, I I use I've got a three but I find I tend to use four upwards um, if you're buying two uh, something like a 10 and a four is quite a good combination you can always add them together uh, 14 I've got a 15 stop virtually never use it but on occasion where you do want to use something longer you can add them together generally in broad daylight a 10 stop a big stopper is not quite enough to give you longer than 30 seconds and most of my exposures I've used here are around a lot of them a minute a one, one and a half minutes to two and a half minutes you're going to be struggling to get that um, unless your camera goes down to ISO 50 and you go down to f18 or f22 you're going to be really pushed in broad daylight to go up uh, go up to a couple of minutes um with just a 10 stop filter um so an extra couple of stops on stop uh, on top of that is not a bad idea so a three or four stop on top of that can be useful um so very filters again really important to get quality you don't want to get one of the cheap ones because all you get is uneven banding effect particularly at the, the the more dense strengths they must be light tight that's why they come with uh, the padding at the back <laughs> i've seen people put the padding in the wrong way around put the padding against the holder on the inside face uh, polarizing filter and can also i one thing i'll often do to make my 10 stop 12 stops i will add my polarizing filter as well so it helps with reducing glare but it also gives an extra two stops as well which will effectively turn the 20 the 30 seconds into into two minutes uh, neutral density filters this isn't particularly about this because you're using this in many many situations but you'll often also use them in combination with uh, with um, uh, neutral density filters and uh, come in different strengths do not buy the, the 03 one stop a bit like the two stop ND complete waste of money it makes so little difference um, it annoys me to see these make the makers buying these selling these things in packs or buy a you know a one stop two stop and a three stop and you'll never use the one stop just don't don't buy it just buy them generally I use three stops um, I've got a hard uh, a three stop hard and a three stop soft and rarely use any of the others 
uh, occasionally use the two, but it's more often the three. And if you overdo it slightly, you can just bring it back in post-processing. So, um, right, oh, that's it. Uh, which is not all that bad timing, it's 10 past. Um, right, so buy the right equipment and accessories, um, develop a few, the technical understanding, and think about the composition and the creativity as well. And as I always say at the, at the end, uh, uh, I say at the end, please, please come on a workshop and hopefully you'll learn a little bit more as well. That's the end, Jay. Brilliant, mate. Um, well, again, I, you know, I, I'm a big fan. We're good friends, but uh, the praise is already coming through. Uh, another exceptional uh, hour and a bit uh, in your company, mate. So thanks for that. Uh, a lot of the questions you have answered, but I've kept a few that we, we need to touch on. Guys, we will ask, answer these questions, but we have run over. Uh, so I will uh, just ans ask Nigel, the ones that we already have now stored up in the bank. Uh, Nigel, you've mentioned a couple of times, very simple, you know, very, um, you, you're not big, you're not, I'm not saying you're not big, but you try not to do much post-processing, but uh, but basic go-to, are you just, a, are you a Photoshop man, you're a Lightroom man, anything specific you're using? Yeah, I, I yeah, it's, I, these things are really what you're used to. I mean, I, uh, so many people I know are, are, are Lightroom fans. Uh, I've just got so much more to the, 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 the bridge Adobe Camera or Photoshop route comes in so much more naturally to me, I must admit, than Lightroom. Lightroom, I always slightly struggle with this um, this uh, import-export thing. <laughs> you know, it's just, but, but the software is the same uh, in terms of um, the raw processing software. All the functions are exactly the same in the latest versions. I just happen to, to prefer the Adobe Camera Raw route. And so you can do so many things without going into Photoshop these days. So many of my images are um, are are simply processed in Adobe Camera Raw and left it uh, at that because you can do virtually everything in that. Uh, sometimes you have to use layers. The one thing, if you've got spot removal, and we all get sense, we all get spots on the sensor occasionally. I find it easier to do that uh, using um, the, um, the patch tool, uh, which the automatic patch tool thing in Photoshop than the uh, tools that you get in Lightroom or ACR. But apart from that, brilliant. Um, how, how, how do you go about calculating the length of the exposure? That was a really good question, actually. Yeah, uh, yeah, a, 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 I kind of usually know, um, but um, therefore I, I'm not off and out because I look at the light and look how many filters I think, ah, oh, that's about right, I've done it before. Uh, however, if you're not so used to it, Lee have got a really useful app. It's called the Lee Big Stopper app, and you can download it for free. Uh, I'm not going to advertise any more than that, but um, it's quite a useful app. And whatever, whichever maker filters you're using, it uh, using, uh, and all it'll do is show what you would have, have used with uh, without using a filter. And it's got an example with a six-stop filter, which they call the little stopper, and a big stopper, which is a ten-stop filter, and shows you the difference. And a very simple equation, by the way, it will turn a thirtieth of a second into thirty seconds. So five stops will take you to one second. Another five will take you to 30 seconds. So that's with a 10-stop filter. Once you've got to know the rules, it's pretty clear. Personally, I kind of look at it and think, ah, oh, that's about two minutes. And the one important thing to remember about long exposures as well, it's not that acute because the difference between, say, two minutes and four minutes, you've got a whole two minutes worth of exposure more is only one stop. And the longer you go, the, the less acute it becomes because you know, a 10 minute exposure compared to 20 is another stop. So it's not that acute. Your meter will go out of the window. Forget using meters. The meter, Canon's, Canon meters become utterly useless with long exposure. <laughs> long exposure photography, they become wildly inaccurate. Uh, the others, perhaps not so bad, but Canon's are particularly, uh, particularly, <laughs> particularly difficult. Um, so it's more a question of using judge judgment, to be honest with you. Brilliant. Uh, do you remember what time of day it was when you shot the uh, the damp shot of St Paul's? Uh, yeah, it's about midday. Oh, there we go. Brilliant. And that yeah. leads me nicely on to my next. I don't think it wouldn't wouldn't vary. Much. Would that kind of shot wouldn't make much difference. What whether what time of day it was. Cloudy day, rainy. You know, it's cloudy day and rainy. You know, so it doesn't make really much difference. Um, leads me nicely into my next question then. Um, what level of um, what's the, uh, let me word this correctly? What level of success with midday shots as opposed to sunrise and sunset? I think. Oh, this is I'm not often stumped with a question. This is actually quite hard. It depends on uh, the type of weather 
as with most photography, it turns on the type of weather. I think obviously an obvious example is where I took the shot of that uh, the dam at the Elam Valley. Clearly, it was a sunset shot or sunrise happens to be a sunset. Therefore, they, that introduces color. If you're shooting towards the sun with the sun in the frame, even though it's a cloudy day, you will get contrast when the sun, more contrast when the sun is closer to the horizon. Uh, apart from that, it really is long exposure photography is more down to, to uh, the the cloud, the type of weather, whether day and whether it is, compared to how high or low the sun is in the sky, really. Because actually, for example, if I go back to, I'm trying to think on my feet slightly here, really. yeah, this one here. All right, I mean, I took these, uh, took these today, um, and um, uh, these were taken about uh, two o'clock in the afternoon. So some was start just below the top. Um, if I'd taken these with clearly their architectural rather than landscape, therefore, to some extent, you want the light penetrating into the buildings. Uh, but equally, I could have taken these on a dull day and got a very similar effect um, with the sun either very high up or very low down. Um, this one, again, it's a, sun, it's a sunset shot, isn't it? So uh, it's, it's really difficult to be definitive on that one. A lot of them, flat light. You know, you can take that any time, really, can't you? The, the the sunlight, the sun sun position there. Ooh, where was it? I think it was quite. Oh, it was about eleven o'clock in the morning, so it's quite high in the sky. So, yeah. But again, those two shooting against the light. So both those, that shot and that shot, the sun's quite low in the sky, so it obviously creates quite a lot of contrast in the cloud. Um, just vary between every situation, really. Perfect, brilliant. Um, but okay. I would say. Oh, okay, sorry. sorry, there is one more, one more point on that. Uh, people will often dismiss the sun high in the sky with a lot, a lot of photography, but actually with long exposure photography, if you're, particularly if you're converting to black and white, you can still get some quite effective shots. So you've got more, I think you've got more flex. I'm trying to think on my feet here slightly, Jay, because it's made me think a little bit, that you have probably got more flexibility with, uh, with light conditions in long exposure photography than you have, than you conventionally have with the short exposure, particularly in landscape where you're constantly looking for for, uh, uh, for for drama, if you like. So if you're using tones in black and white in particular, then the time of day and the type uh, uh, matters less than I think in many other situations. Brilliant. Uh, I'm going to make sure I read this. We've, we've only got a couple left, so I'm just going to make sure I read this properly yeah. for you. Um, with long lenses, would you advise using an additional support rails to make the tripod uh, more stable and to eliminate vibrations uh, often uh, in the case of using portrait mode in instead of landscape mode? Does that make sense? Yeah, the only thing I'd say here is that I very rarely use a long, uh, a long focus lens for, um, for long exposure photography. More typically you're using, and this, this is a generalization, but you're, 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 you're more often than not, you're looking at quite broad skies, you're looking at broad expanses of water, you're looking at, at, at that kind of effect. Usually, usually with the shots that I'm taking, if I skip through most of these, more often than not, they're, they're shot using wide lenses. Uh, not, in, not in total, there's one there of, uh, of um, uh, Port, Teal, Port Talbot Steelworks, not a brilliant shot in truth, um, taken, at, uh, taken with a longer focus lens, but usually, uh, usually uh, a wider one, which is less critical. But certainly anything required to keep the lens steady and certainly use, if you use a long, long focus lens, use the mirror up as well because that can create, certainly can create vibration. Um, if it's windy, it's going to move anyway. The biggest problem can be if you're using shots of, particularly with the vibration mirror, for those of you who've got DSLRs, if you've got a mirrorless camera, don't worry about it. Um, but it um, uh, uh, can be a real problem if you've got uh, exposure, say, of maybe a quarter of a second to about a second or two, because the vibrate, the time it vibrates compared to the total is quite short. With a 30 second or a minute or more, then it might vapor, vibrate a little bit at the, at the start, but it'll, 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 it'll settle down. So you won't notice the effect. It becomes more critical when you've got those 
maybe an eighth of a second to a, to a second or two, then you will see the effect. Brilliant. Uh, we're almost there. Uh, oh, well, okay, this is a good question. Uh, I don't know. Um, so obviously, you know, we, we talked a lot about filters and combining them to nights and the different effects that it will create. And obviously, you know, we, we have done a lot in the hour. Um, best way of get, when getting started with filters, is any, any books or any particular work to go and look at specifically to get an idea of the different things that it can do? I know we've touched on it tonight. Any, a book, any books? Are there, asked, sorry, a uh, question was asking, are there any books? No, are there any books that you'd recommend? On you know, on oh, right. when, when using filters and and the, you know getting Ooh. getting started really, you know the effects that I, it's going to do, I, how it's going to affect the photos. I honestly can't. I've, I I don't think I've ever read a book on book on filters. Um, the photographic press have got you know the magazines have always covering this kind of stuff. Um, uh, I know we I know we haven't really talked about. Uh, I'm stumped. <laughs> I know I'm we have them because I just don't know one. <laughs> and there must be some long. I mean, Google, Google long exposure photography. I'm sure Google would come up with something. <laughs> have we done a Have we done a film on filters? You'd have to remind me. Well, not specifically, no. But uh, this crosses obviously crosses into it. But we haven't specifically done a film on filters. But I'm more okay. than happy to do one specifically on filters. Yeah, but clearly, there's a crossover we between should. the weather one and a long exposure one in terms of how you use and apply filters. We should make that in, in the new, you know, we're, we're planning some films soon. Maybe we should include that one as well, mate. Yeah. I'm not for definite. Um, well, I know we didn't want to. I'd, yeah, I'd, just, I'd be Googling it as far as the book is concerned. Um, I know that we uh, didn't want to plug brands. I know that you're a fan of Nissi as well as Lee and so on. Um, but the Lee, well, I'm, not I, I guess, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of brands. Sure. I the right, right. Does the job. No, but I, my heart always sinks when anyone comes up to my um you're probably going to, going to mention it right at the end i've got to stand at the photography show um in uh in, next week uh, stan g23 and um, uh, and my, heart, my, heart, my heart always sinks when somebody walks up and said are you a nikon or a canon man i just want to i just, <laughs> I just want to go and hide <laughs> <laughs> and it always happens it always <laughs> happens usually Absolutely. usually a certain type with a big camera around no, it doesn't just happen to you, mate. It happens to all of us. Absolutely all of us. So don't worry about that. Brilliant. Uh, well, that is it for tonight, guys. Like I said, last reminder, if you haven't looked at it already, go and check out the free digital online magazine, the Big Photo magazine. Uh, my thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. Again, for my thanks to you, Nigel, and I'll see you in Birmingham week after next, mate. You will. Cheers. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody. Take care.